This publication, which was wrong, was scientifically implausible, which should never have been published to start with. Well, this is much more than just an argument about science. This has been a dispute with real impact on society. Judges that we have up here, we want to introduce them to you first. 
driving all the way from Hartford at the speed limit, no speeding. We have a host from Fox 61 Hartford. He went here to UConn, a communication political science major, so let's welcome him back to UConn, Ben Goldman. Department of Communication. She is an assistant professor and an expert on social media and technology, and she works with our very own STEM experts here at UConn to improve their communication. Please welcome Dr. Anna LaBerge. And last but not least, the founder and the uh, public speaking guru of the communication department here at UConn. Uh, he was the host for the last five years for the public speaking competition. We couldn't let him go. He's an assistant professor in, of, in the Department of Communication, director of undergraduate studies. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Rory Malloy. Thank you all of our judges for being here tonight, and also a special thank you to Rory for putting this together for the UConn community for years and coming back to help us judge tonight. Thank you. So, we've got judges, we've got hosts, we've got a huge audience. Thank you for coming. Good way to get here early, huh? Okay. We're missing one thing to make this a competition. We are missing the contestants. So let's go ahead and bring them out. Please welcome tonight's contestants. Individuals. Our first contestant, senior allied health major from Weathersfield, Connecticut. Please help me in welcoming Kathleen Moriarty. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Good? So I've been a self-described nerd pretty much as long as I can remember. So I spent most of my college career in the lab in the library. I've chosen Homer B over bars more times than I can count. Thanks to this, I've been able to get some pretty decent grades, but my social life has gone straight down the toilet. I talk to my roommates, my dog, my lab mates, and sometimes I'll go see a professor if I'm struggling. On most nights when my peers are going out and partying and having fun and making new friends, I'm just developing a progressively more intimate relationship with my body. This might sound like every parent's dream to send their kid off to college where their kid's going to study and work hard and get good grades, but this is part of what's contributing to this lack of communication between the scientific community and the rest of the world. When I lock myself in a study room on a Friday night, I'm missing out on social interaction happening all around campus. All this networking and building of social skills that I'm missing out on. When I do go out, I'm almost overwhelmed at my own awkwardness. I start trying to tell people about how I've micro-injected zebrafish embryos with GFP to track their primordial germ cell migration. And it usually takes me a while to realize that the people I'm with don't want to hear about that. This is part of why scientists struggle to pass their findings on to people that aren't involved in the scientific community. So social media is the main way that communication is passed around these days. Social media makes it so easy to share everything and anything you come across, regardless of how accurate that information is. A study by MIT in 2013 found that on Twitter, falsehoods spread 10 to 20 times faster than accurate information. Now, I don't find this all that surprising. Anyone can hop on Twitter and write a few facts that are fun and interesting and most likely not true. It's how a mob can spread the anti-vaxxer movement or how a president can continually find evidence to support his uh, denial of climate change. Scientists aren't on these websites and social media outlets as much as the normal person because they're too busy in their labs and trying to get their information published in scientific journals. So scientists really need to start stepping it up and learning how to communicate with people that aren't involved in the scientific community. There's a reason that art majors need to take Q courses before they graduate. Such a large part of education is identifying your weaknesses and addressing them and getting better at them. Now, social skills aren't the same as a math course. You can't wrap them up into a neat little formula that you can plug and chug on an exam. 
But it's because of this that I think STEM majors really need to work harder to improve their social and communication skills. Individuals need to push themselves, and professors need to encourage them to do so. Whether that be joining a, a club on campus that has nothing to do with anything science, or just going to a bar trivia night with your friends and relaxing and having fun and talking to people. Nobody should need an advanced degree to know what's going on in the science world and to know what great advancements are going on. Now, I have this big, nerdy vision that someday we'll be passing around scientific findings the same way that we do celebrity gossip. But this isn't going to happen unless scientists really start to work hard and push themselves to be able to talk to people and communicate their findings in a way that's interesting and easy to understand. So I majored in Allied Health Sciences, but I also chose two minors very carefully. I chose to minor in molecular and cellular biology because I love science and I wanted to learn about how cool it is. My second minor I chose is communications because science is so important, but what good is it if we can't talk about it? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kathleen. We'll start with Roy Malone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, host. Good evening, Kathleen. Good to see everyone out here tonight. So, uh, tough spider is first judge. Kathleen, thank you very much. I one of the things I really enjoyed about the speech right off the bat was towards the end you had a call to action. You actually gave scientists directly something to do. I think that's so important. You told them that they need to step up, they need to push themselves, and you're actually a nice role model for them to follow, right? Majoring in uh, social science, but also in hard science. Thank you. Um, from some feedback standpoint, I'd like to maybe be uh, a little bit more deliberate in terms of commanding the, the, the room's attention there. I think that you sound a little nervous. When we hear you in the second round, command this audience's attention. They're your peers and, and, and really kind of let them know. And then one other thing, um, the soft open, right? So I think when we hear from you again, right, come out and give us a, a direct opening right to start. Tell us exactly what you want us to think or why we want to think it and work on that attention together. Um, but overall, really well formulated and great, great use of support materials. <laughs> thank you, Rory. And all the first. Oh, thank you. Um, that was a great speech. Thank you. Was, um, I loved hearing your perspective, coming from your own science, kind of various science background. Um, so I thought the opening was really nice to have your story of kind of here's what's been my experience, and then tying that into kind of the problem of science communication. Um, there, I, I noticed some of the references. They were great. Um, I felt like sometimes it skipped around a little bit, so I was trying to follow the thread of kind of where you're going with the different pieces of the story. I think you have a lot of different pieces of kind of what you were saying and kind of how to tie those together um, was the only thing that I followed a little bit there. And then also with some of the um, points that you're making, like if there are specific examples, kind of drawing out some more like great science communication on social media that you've seen, like maybe an example there, like here's a scientist that that's really well, maybe that's a great model for that. But overall, um, while hearing your story, how you pulled that into the topic. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Ben Bolton. Good evening, everybody. Well, Kathleen, uh, bonus points for being from Weathersfield. That's my hometown, so you started out strong. Um, I, come, I come at this almost like a, a being on a, a TV, so more of a presence. And I think if I could add just a, a, a bit of a critique that I'd love to see in round two, and it could be because your voice is strained, too, we can tell. Um, at the end of your sentences, I notice your voice is kind of just trailing off a bit, and that be, not because it's weak, but at the end of your sentence, just get through that entire sentence just to keep everybody's attention. Uh, that'd be great. But having said that, uh, you, you personalized the speech. A little bit of self-deprecation was in there, too, so that's always great. We got a couple laughs. Um, but I think anything that you can do in the future, whether it be eye contact or uh, maybe really connecting with one or two audience members in the first couple rows, Anything you can do to really connect and bring that um, aspect of I'm, I'm not giving a memorized speech because obviously it was well organized and all the points were, were hit, but anything you can do to really make it seem like I'm telling you a story and I want to stay interested in that story, that'd be great. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, so we are underway, and our next speaker is a junior ecology and evolutionary biology major from Walcott, Connecticut. Please welcome Amanda Pastor. We live in an America where about one in every five people don't accept that the theory of evolution is true. In America, where about half of us don't accept that climate change is happening, or don't accept that humans are the reason it's happening. 
Because in America, all information is created equal, which is why we have people marching to protect children from vaccines. But there's not really national outrage over the fact that fracking companies are poisoning our water. How did America fall to this point? A point where people rely on their horoscopes to tell them what their own personality is. A point where parents are denying vaccines for their children out of an irrational fear that they will cause autism. A point where we have a society of flat earthers who think that our space agency that has provided us with decades of technological innovations and scientific advancement has faked every single image of outer space and that they somehow profit off of hiding the true shape of the Earth. How did we get to this point? I need you to take a step back. Whose job was it to make sure that we had the critical thinking skills necessary for today's world? To understand science? Was it the American public school system? The one that currently lags behind almost every other developed country in math and science? The one where teachers have to protest to earn a living wage? The one where they might not be able to focus on the curriculum because they have to focus on how they're gonna pay their bills? Who expected that this system would raise people in the 21st century to think critically? I question all college students and academics. Can you seriously look at a misinformed person and blame them? Someone who went through the American public school system, can you blame them for not having critical thinking skills and falling victim to confirmation bias? We take for granted the fact that higher education has endowed us with this ability to think critically. And it's almost as if from an elite pedestal we say to the misinformed, it's not my job to educate you, do your own research. As if people who are uneducated have the ability to understand how to research, how do you do good research? It is because of this that America has ended up at this point. So what do we do to fix it? I say we start by talking. Because, no, we can't go on Facebook and Twitter 24 hours a day, find every single misinformed person, every single inadequate source, every single radicalized individual, and we can't confront every single one of them. But education isn't free, and education isn't equal, and we're privileged to be here and to have the knowledge we have. So if we can take a moment to talk to one radicalized person and say, I don't think you're stupid, but please consider what I have to say then you might plant a seed of critical thinking that will grow, grow inside of them, and the next time they see a piece of misinformation or fake news, they won't believe it. Or at least you'll get them to think twice. Thank you. So we're gonna start, nicely done Amanda. We're gonna start with Anne for this first round of people. Thank you. Uh, I love the passion that you walked out with about this, about the questions you were asking. I thought that was a really good way to kind of engage, um, to bring up the questions. You had the good pauses there, um, which always come in, you look up and go, who oh, should say next? Um, I felt like it maybe needed a little bit of a balance with a little bit more, um, some of the main points of kind of what are some of the issues that you're seeing. So you have like, the, the, the big issues that you're making. Um, I guess I'm not articulating right now, um, but pulling in some of the references, some of the, the facts, um, some of the issues right now, more specifically, like pinpointing some of those, um, those um, but I love that you end with a conclusion that says, how do we potentially solve this problem and give people a takeaway, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right, Ben, we are moving right to you. Great job. I mean, no notes, that's awesome. For someone that lives with a teleprompter in front of them most of the time, that's awesome. That's great. I think the pauses were really good. I think your strongest suit in that speech was the fact that you were able to simplify the content enough to put your points so blankly out there. You know what I mean? Like when we're doing an interview, we, we want to make the question so simple that whoever we're interviewing 
has to answer and has to give us a clear answer. So you did such a great job on that. Um, the only thing that I would say would be your speech almost crescendoed in a way that got more interesting as it started. I think at the very, very beginning of that speech, if there could be something that would just grab everybody, that way we wouldn't have to wait you know, 30 seconds to get more interested and more interested. You won't lose anybody in the beginning. Uh, but great job. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Rory, last but not least. Excellent. I thought that it really stood out to me that there was a sense of urgency from the moment that you began. I love the rate and the cadence, and you utilized your pitch, and you drew us in, and then you made your statements, and you moved with inflection, which is something that we talk about as kind of those higher level aspects of public speaking. So I really felt it was genuine. I believe you. I believe that you want action to take place. I believe that you want to change, and that's something that I care about is, is motivation. motivation. The one critique, and I think this may have been what Ann was talking a little bit about, was at one point you talked a little bit about education is the problem, what has happened to our public school system, but the conclusion then took us to a place about talking to people, and I'd like to have seen what the connection was between the education's role in this and then what the responsibilities they play in the conversations that we'll have. You'll get a chance to come back in the third round and probably have a chance to address some of that, so it might be a chance to bring that link together. Nice job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge. Right along, our third speaker is a sophomore animal science and patho pathobat biology major from Glastonbury, Connecticut. Please help me in welcoming <laughs> Megan Goodrich. Gathering followers along the campaign trail. For example, 
our president, Donald Trump, entire campaign and presidency is built upon a people's fear of the unknown and misunderstood. So now you know what fear mongering is. And we can end the spread of articles that are intended to incite fear by being able to weed out sources that are incredible. By being able to read an article and understand if it is trustworthy or not is very important, and here are three steps to do so. One, we must help put an end to the endless sharing of articles based on their titles on social media platforms like Facebook. Titles can be very misleading. Sometimes it's all it takes to convince people that their favorite coffee or alcoholic drink will shorten their lifespan, even if the article below cites no evidence that this is true. Two, we must know how to tell if an author is credible or not. Bloggers and supposed experts who comment below articles are not trustworthy <coughs> sources. And if someone posts something online, it's very important to cross-check that information to see if other credible sources validate their claims. We must teach people how to use resources <coughs> like Google Scholar. And three. We must teach others how to look closely at data presented and determine if it's trustworthy or not. Many people don't know that data can be funded by big money companies with an agenda to scare people from using products or using other companies. So once we have helped people learn how to properly research topics, we must do our part to keep science apart from politics. Once science becomes political, it changes the way that people perceive the information. And a huge reason that people do not trust scientific articles is because they believe that the articles are written by government agencies intended to deceive them. Now, I'm not saying any of us in here can make people trust the government. But what we can do is help people understand what we're trying to say by using less confusing language in reports and briefings. In this way, people can make informed decisions on their own and not feel like they're being misled. As academics, we need to do our part to combat politicians who use the fear of people who are not experts in science to their advantage. Often people's opinions on scientific matters are influenced by what the politicians they look up to support. And if a prominent politician discredits science, those who support them will follow suit. Speaking out, going to rallies, writing letters, or voting for candidates who support scientific research can reduce the spread of fear mongering. Now that I've been preaching for the last five minutes, it's time to conclude. In conclusion, the great barrier between communication, between the public and science, is the fear produced by those with agendas. As academics, it is our responsibility to understand and teach others that the fear mongering is deliberately inciting fear. Some resources may appear to be trustworthy, but they're really not. And fear mongering is a political tactic that can be used to stop the communication of science. We must do our part as professors, students, parents, and teachers to speak loudly, write clearly, and open listening. Open, listen, listen openly. To drown out the voices of those who wish to see the hard work of scientists, government agents, and good journalists undermined. The next time your Facebook friend shares an article that says everyone's favorite childhood food will give us all cancer, please say <coughs> thank you. Reach out, open communication, and stop this cycle. Thank you.
running back in. I was waiting for the hype music. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with Ben this time. Um, does this sound good? Uh, I thought that you did a really great job at going from more lighthearted statements or funnier statements, looking to get a laugh, going right to something serious. Your voice changed, your pitch changed. Um, I think you did a good job at kind of walking around and making eye contact with everybody. That's so important to engage everyone. I think where we lost you was, was where, where you paused. And where you paused a lot, where you paused when you were looking at your note cards. And I think that if you could just make that a little bit more fluid in the next rounds and make your voice a bit stronger in the next, round, next rounds and just not make it so obvious that we're looking at those main points, um, that would be helpful. And also just whenever you're going to conclude, just a personal thing, I would never say, hey, to conclude. I just would make that a little bit more natural, but I think you're on a good track. Okay, we're in point. Okay, Megan, thank you. At the top of our judging sheet here, it says the introduction was unique and gained audience attention. Check. Um, so that was good. Um, also, uh, Ben, in our introduction and conclusion section, we actually sometimes utilize a conclusion so we know it's coming to an end, so if you could not give the students uh, all the information. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry, Megan, so that makes an interesting point. I actually like the fact that you move well, but one of the things I think that you've got to be um, aware of is when you're moving, your arms are moving with you, which means the microphone's moving with your hand, which means the microphone's moving with your mouth. So when you come back to the second and third round, microphone uh, closer to the mouth will actually make it a little bit easier for you to hear your articulation. So that's something I really uh, would encourage you to pay attention to there. The other thing I might just suggest is like when you were making some of your points, two ideas. Ben talked about using the note cards. One of the things I think might help, have a longer sentence structure to help your cadence. So extend the sentence structure a little bit so you kind of hit that, that cadence. I see Barack Obama listed as your public speaking role model. He used to have this great kind of public speaking cadence, right? And then he hit that last point. So I think if you had a little longer sentence structure, that might help with that. And then, you know, just as you work on that third round speech, just a little bit tighter on some of the points. Make a point, give the example, and then kind of move on so you don't feel like you're having to kind of linger on a point until you felt like you really hit it. Um, but nice job. And I think the last thing I'll say is that, you know, great speeches aren't always ones that we agree with. Great speeches aren't ones that, that necessarily do the things that we want to hear. You challenge a lot of assumptions in that speech. And, and, you, and I think you probably moved a lot of people to think critically, and that was your goal. So well done. Thank you, Rory. Anna Yeah, um, I think that both your initial and second introductions both gained our attention, so. Um, <laughs> uh, I love the way you opened up with that the thing that we're, I think we're all familiar with, that sort of like BuzzFeed type of headline thing and how that draws us in, right? And then pull that into how does this lead to all these other problems. Um, I also, the use of space, I thought was great that you're walking around and it felt like you were in the whole room uh, rather than just kind of talking in one spot. Um, I did feel like you bounced back and forth a little bit with sort of the main points. So when you got to like the three steps for how to critically assess articles, I kind of felt like that was an ending and then it like picked back up again and moved on for a second time. Um, so just kind of figuring out that timing of where to put those different things um, and where it feels kind of like a story arc of a natural, like how you move into sort of a peak and then go into the conclusion from there. So, but great job. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Megan. Thank you, Jenny. So our fourth speaker is a senior animal science and journalism double major from Hamden, Connecticut. Please welcome Marley Swenson. We're in a crisis right now. We're in a crisis where legislators think that 50 years of global warming is perfectly natural. We're in a crisis where industrial age diseases are re-rearing their ugly heads once again. We're in a crisis where 25% of all Americans think that the sun revolves around the Earth. Are you there, Galileo? It's me, Marlies. You really need your help down here. <laughs> and that help starts with us. It starts with us, with college students, the future educators, the future leaders, the future parents of the world. It's going to start with how we look at our college education and our college classes, and not just sequestering ourselves into our majors. It's going to start with how we approach and how we communicate with those science deniers and communicating with respect and dignity to them. It's going to start in how we're breaking down the walls between academia and science and the general public. This change is not easy. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be long, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be institutional. 
But the change in how we communicate science needs to happen for the sake of our future, for the sake of our planet, and for the sake of ourselves. And the first thing that we need to look at is not complaining about our gen eds. Yes, I know, you're a communications major. You don't want to go to your mandatory biology lab. Yes, I know, you're a pre-med. You don't want to go to your mandatory public speaking course. But the fact of the matter is, taking skills from both sides is a benefit to all. A study by the National Foundation for Science discovered that doctors who had taken communications courses showed more empathy with their patients. A communications major that has a fundamental understanding of biology and physics is not only able to understand the scientists talking about it, but also able to communicate it on their own terms. We need scientists who are able to communicate the research that they are studying, and we need communications majors and non-science majors to be able to understand what they're talking about. Secondly, we need to start approaching those science deniers, those flat earthers, those anti-vaxxers, those climate change deniers with more respect and with more dignity. I understand. It can be funny, and it can be easy to mock your Aunt Betty on Facebook because she likes to hawk her Herbalife essential oils. <laughs> I know, it's funny, but if you approach her with that kind of attitude, if you attack her and mock her and patronize her, and patronize those who deny science, you're not going to be helping your side at all. You're going to make them feel attacked, and they're going to be defensive. They're just going to curl up into their own little bubble of denial all the more. We need to start approaching them with the dignity that all humans need and deserve. We need to approach them with understanding and a willingness to understand them so that we can inform them with gentleness and so they can move forward as better people, more informed and make informed and more scientifically based decisions. And lastly, we as academics and we as scientists need to break down the barriers between us and the general public. We need to stop publishing articles in journals that charge up to $800 for access for a single scientific article. And we need to stop filling those articles with jargon and technical language that the layperson cannot understand. We need to take more of an active role in communicating our research and promoting it. We have social media at our fingertips now. It's so easy to take a picture of a sample that you're working on as a mycologist and post it to Twitter. It's so easy to write a blog about your day-to-day -day experiences as a researcher. The reason that shows like the Mythbusters and Bill Nye the Science Guy and the Magic School Bus are so compelling is not because they're educational. They take something complicated and they boil it down and they make it compelling. They don't turn the human body into a boring physics lecture. Instead, they turn it into an adventure. They turn it into an explosion. They turn it into something that you want to watch on a Saturday night when you have free time. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, this change isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to have to rearrange your credits so you can take more communications courses or take more science courses. It's not going to be easy to hold back your flat earther beams whenever you're going around on Reddit. It's not going to be easy to push for more journals to have open access policies or to take the time to blog about your experiences as a scientist every day. But it's also not going to be easy in 20 years when we have to clean up the mess of climate change. It's not going to be easy 10 years down the road when we have to bury those who died of a preventable disease. This change needs to happen. This change in how we communicate science and how we approach science needs to happen. And that change needs to start with us here and now. Thank you. So you made a point and you said that shows like Bill Nye the Science Guy and Magic School Bus, they did something that was important, they made it compelling. You just made this competition compelling right now, all right? I really appreciate the way in which you took on a rate of urgency. Your cadence told us that this was serious. You hit the highs and the lows, you were funny, 
you were sad, you were serious, the, the drama was all in there. You used parallelism to open, you had a call to action to close. And, and personally, what I really enjoyed about it was your rate. You spoke fast. I listen to my podcast sometimes on twice speed just because to me that I get through more content that way. And I, I could probably listen to you uh, give speeches again because your rate was so quick. So I really appreciated that. You had great vocal command. So my one piece of feedback would be is that if you could mix in a couple of really well planned pauses for dramatic effect, I think you could have hit your mark on some of those jokes even more so. They were good. I think that you have a spot there to make them great. Overall, great job. Well done. Thank you, Lori. And yeah, outstanding, honestly. Um, what I really liked about it, to put a more fine point on why I thought it was great, is it, it was so satisfyingly packaged. Like you had these three key points, you spent kind of equal time and weight on each of them, they were each really well thought out. You came back to them at the end, in kind of uh, uh, alluding back to them in your final points. Um, it had a really clear start, really clear end. You had that passion and the humor mixed in really well together. Um, even some alliteration, just with the way you were saying your sentences, it just it felt so nice to follow the way you were talking about it. Um, the only thing I would add is just, it because of the humor and the passion, it felt very conversational. So if you can just feel like you're having a little bit more conversation with individual people in the audience, like maybe just stepping out a little bit more um, and kind of engaging with people within the audience, but otherwise, really great job, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Eric. Marley's great job. I mean, your timing, it, it's almost like a comedian's time. I mean, the, the whole, you know, you have no plans on a Saturday night, and you're waiting for them to laugh instead of going on. And sometimes you just want to fill that silence. It's great. Um, your intro was awesome, that call to action, and the, the way that you use volume, you know, to, to really grab everybody's attention and maintain their attention was awesome. The, the one thing that I would like to see more of a little bit like Anne said, was you didn't move much from that black mark on the, on the floor. And I think that if you can just move around and use all of the space that we have to not only keep your attention with content, but also with, with proximity as well, I think that that would be a, a homework. Great job. <laughs> Thank you, judges. Thank you, judges. Thank you. is our freshman management major from Southington, Connecticut. Please help me in welcoming Jennifer Mason. Every year, the scientific community witnesses the publication of an estimated 1.8 million papers covering anything from astronomy to zoology. Where do you think I found the figure 1.8 million? Another study. The pursuit of knowledge and the craving for a better understanding of our world have been pushing forward the boundaries of discovery since the beginning of time, and indeed, the boundaries of communication as well. The methods of disseminating scientific knowledge change almost as much as the body of knowledge itself. My grandfather, who graduated from UConn in the 1950s, purchased a beautiful 20-piece set of encyclopedias in 1970 from a door-to-door -door salesman. Our family still has them, and I have to say that they still look brand new in their red binding and golden lettering, even though the passage on the Beatles is written in the present tense. <laughs> At the time, that set of books was a portal into a world of possibilities, offering a glimpse into the cutting edge of new developments across all academic disciplines, just as the Salons of the Enlightenment or the writings of Plato were at one time. Today we have the internet at our disposal, where scientists can not only share their findings, but allow anybody from across the globe to access their developments like that. But with this great power comes great responsibility. It is all too easy to simply accept what we are told without critical thinking, objectivity, or inquisitiveness. The wealth of information offered through modern technology is staggering. It becomes tempting to consume the narratives that are sensational and often fake without even a second thought. According to a 2016 Pew Research study, 32% of Americans report seeing fake news online, not even including the pervasive, biased, or inaccurate information in the media as well. I offhandedly tried to find the author of the quote I paraphrased earlier, with great power comes great responsibility. And I found that that quote has been attributed to the likes of Winston Churchill, 
Voltaire, even a character from the Spider-Man movies. Something as simple as the origin of a quote can offer a kind of nuance that may be more accessible in this digital age, but more easily overlooked as well, as we are constantly inundated with new information. It is imperative that as young leaders, voters, and professionals, we strive to not only improve our own scientific literacy, but to consume and communicate information with empirical minds that question what we are taught to assume, seek both sides of the story, and convey complexities as they emerge. We can use the eye-catching visual tools and social media at our disposal to pass on what we have learned. But these devices should never be prioritized over science. Everything we share should be analyzed objectively and with the knowledge that the field of science is ever-changing, as is the way that we communicate. The door-to-door -door salesman who came to the door in 1970 probably didn't realize what an impact he created, what exploration ensued, or what predictions would be manifested all these years later. Indeed, in one of the passages in one of the volumes entitled The History of Computers, it states that, quote, computers of the future will be used more and more to provide immediate answers to problems, close quote. The authors were correct, but it is up to every single one of us to go beyond the immediate and get to the truth. Our very future depends on it. Thank you. I really like the, the flow that you had. Um, it felt very relaxed and like you were just kind of sitting and telling us um, these ideas that you have. And I thought that you, I, I really like that you pulled in those specific facts. Those kind of stood out to me, but they fit right in. Um, I feel like sometimes there could have been a little bit more, I don't know, I guess, what am I trying to say? Um, something to kind of punch the point home a little bit more, right? So. Um, you have this nice story with, with uh, the encyclopedia, and you brought that back at the end. And then I just felt like somewhere in the middle, something could have peaked a little bit more, if that makes sense. So just kind of finding maybe that one thing that really um, pulls us in. Kind of, I always think of that story arc, and I said that before, but kind of the, the center there that you can sort of come back down from. But um, otherwise, really nice flow, really uh, well put together story there. Thank you. Thank you, and Ben. Great job. You are a really good, engaging speaker. You used the area great. I think. You used your hands in a way that kept me engaged, at least. I think your voice was awesome. I think the way that you stressed certain words and paused and used your tempo was awesome. Uh, but like Anne, I think that if there was something midway through the speech that really grabbed everyone, so like maybe a question, maybe something that just really kept everybody interested and engaged, I think that would have been even, even better. Great job. Okay, and we're going. Jennifer, great delivery. From start to finish, you're an excellent storyteller. You're captivating, and you're somebody who I enjoyed listening to. You had a tone that was perseverant, but yet it was still soft enough that it was something that I wanted to listen to. I wasn't shouted at, and, and, and it didn't feel as if it was something that I couldn't relate to. So, well done. To go start to finish with no notes, to really have not missed a beat, to maintain connection with the audience, eye contact moments, gesturing pauses, it was a great display of contemporaneous speaking, so I'd like to commend you for that. Uh, overall, I really liked some of the examples. I love the door-to-door -door salesman concept, and if I have the question for you in the second round, I already know what it's going to be. Well done. Okay, nice job. Thank you. Thank you.
is a question and answer period. So we, prior to the start of the show, we paired up each judge with a number of individuals. So each individual contestant will receive one question uh, from a judge. They will have two minutes to respond, and this will be the second part of our, uh, of our, there we go, thank you. No cards are very nice. Uh, second part of our competition here tonight. Okay, so first up, let's get Marlies lesson. And Marlies, with a microphone, <laughs> your question will come from Ian Holbrook. Okay. All right. In a moment to sort of regather myself. Uh, I'll come back to this one, right? So. Um, I guess my question, oh geez, <laughs> I'm sort of formulating everything on the spot myself so I know how you feel. Um, <laughs> I guess my question, based on some of the examples you've given, um, with like the humor that you pulled in the Facebook, the Aunt Betty, I really like that, um, with the entertainment, my question is, how do you see those things coming together? I guess. What is the role that you see of something like entertainment in this communication space? Like, how do you see that utilized as a tool? Um, you brought up some great examples. Do you see a way that that can be um, a space for science communication? And how might that work as entertainment, since that's where a lot of our media comes from? Thank you. That's a that's a really good question. And honestly, I think that when we are thinking about communicating really anything, we need to take advantage of human psychology. And if you'll notice, if you've ever read Aesop's Fables, if you've ever read uh, the Please Behave and Don't Bug Your Parents books that you probably <laughs> read in kindergarten, you'll notice that lessons are often packaged in stories. And we have been telling stories since the dawn of time. Uh, I think that a key thing in communicating science isn't just to treat it as a clinical set of data. And I know some researchers are very married to this, and they feel very cheated when their story is turned into some sort of epic start to a middle to end uh, kind of story about how it's being done. But that's how people, I think, best process a concept and best process information. I mean, I love the Mythbusters. I mentioned that uh, in my speech. And the way that they conduct an experiment and the way that they go about in research is completely scientific. They make sure that they have good sources. They talk to experts. They make sure to run a control trial. They make sure to run um, several test trials. They will often have the, okay, we're just going to explode a trial, but that's part of the entertainment bit. But some of the most important things that they do is they make it a story. They have a start. They have a narrative. They have a nexus, a genesis of the myth that they're looking at. They have kind of a crescendo. They have pitfalls. They have issues that they have to fight against you'll often notice that pretty much every single show that they've done can actually be lined up to the hero's journey. I think when we do that, we can create and make science more personal for people. Now, it can be kind of silly feeling to maybe have the tale of the brave little cancer cell and how it was used to say, figure out how we can cure mesothelioma, but when we package it that way, I think it's going to be a lot more interesting than just tossing a research paper at somebody and saying, clinical data says that, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Marlise. Next we have Kathleen Moriarty. Your question is coming from Rory Floyd. Okay, one last one, water. <clears throat> you don't yet have a chair for the common cold. Here I am. All right, Kathleen, so in your speech, you talked about scientists needing to step up. They've got to get better. And you talked about, just like a good scientific study, the scientists themselves must address their weaknesses and identify what skills they can improve. And you concluded by stating that we need to get these scientists to do these things. But the one piece that was missing was the action plan. Because if you've talked to scientists, they're not often the easiest group to motivate to do what you want them to do. So my question for you, very clearly, is going to be, what specifically will you do to convince others to follow in similar footsteps to pursue dual degrees, one being a social science and one being a traditional hard science? So, <clears throat> if I 
in terms of my career path, I really want to be a genetic counselor. And a big role of genetic counselors is that they interpret all of this you know, current genetic research and use it to help their patients. Um, and I think that that's a great position to be able to talk to both people in academia doing this research and also talk to common people that aren't involved in all this scientific research. So I think um, in a position of being a genetic counselor, I hope to someday um, help to educate these academics on the more uh, nuanced parts of social skills and how to use those skills to communicate their findings in a way that's easy to consume and also interesting. Um, and then I can also use my position to talk to patients who most of which are everyday people and teach them how to um, look at scientific findings and news sources with a critical eye in order to better educate themselves and prepare themselves. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so next up is Jennifer McDonald. Come on up here. And Jennifer, your question is for Ben Gold. I want to go back to your story about that door-to-door -door salesman. <laughs> but I'm really having an idea, but I, I want to take it a different way. From a news perspective, I'm all about trust, trusting sources, and I think that's an overarching theme tonight. Back in the 50s when they bought that encyclopedia, if they needed an answer, if your family needed an answer, they would go to that book and they would trust that book and what it had to say. Now, it's almost the opposite. We go to the internet, we hit Google, we have 19,000 different pages, Fox 61 being one of those pages that has whatever answer you need to basically anything. How, in this era, with all of those pages coming up, with all of those answers coming up, and all of those sources, how do, you, how do you keep trust and how do you pass that trust down in the same way that those folks are passed down? Well, that's a great question. And we do have a great responsibility and a lot of power because I can imagine if I was 18 years old in 1977, um, and I had to look at my encyclopedia that was from 1970, and I wanted to write about something that happened in 1975, I couldn't get that information, I'd have to go and seek it out somewhere else. So today we are, we do have that, that great value of the internet. However, I think that when we are analyzing the sources for their credibility and their accuracy and reliability, it all comes down to our scientific literacy skills and analyzing, is this piece of information peer-reviewed? Did it go through the Institutional Review Board for ethical approval? Um, what other cross-references are available? Uh, other, other scientists that have been involved in this research um, really just trying to understand, did the um, experimenters go through a scientific methodology that prioritizes empirical thinking and prioritizes limiting confounding variables and any kind of experimental biases. That's really the best thing that we can all do and something that anybody can do the second we leave this auditorium. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> all right, excellent. Next up is Megan. Your question is from Ada. All right, I'm all ready this time. Uh, <laughs> So you were, you most of your focus was on the fear of mongering, right? And a lot of the checking the headlines and um, kind of fact checking what's going on and thinking about who's posting, what the agenda is and all this. And so I guess my question is, whose responsibility do you think it is? Or what are the different responsibilities that you think different entities have, right? So the individuals as a consumer of this information versus social media sites where this information ends up versus politicians versus scientists, like, where do you see that the responsibility lies in uh, how that information is presented and how we deal with that? That's a really great question. I'm really glad you asked that because recently, I don't know if anybody saw in the news, but Britain is trying to pass laws that are really, really aggressive that make social media platforms like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, have a designated government agent that monitors hate speech and other infactual posts online, and they make sure that this isn't 
made up or intentionally meant to target any groups. And if these social media platforms aren't keeping up with taking down the articles that are false, intended to spread, uh, spread fear mongering or hate speech, then the social media platforms will be fined. So if Britain passes this law, they're going to be the most strict company or uh, country on social media, online monitoring. And I think those are policies that we should adopt in the US too. We have such a problem, and this has come up since the shooting in uh, the mosque. And that applies to hate speech, but it also can apply to articles that are about fear mongering in science. So I think that this is something that we should have. We should have people in the companies and a government agency or a particular agent position that keeps track of these things. So if they see something online, they need to make sure that the company's aware and intends to take it down. For us, as people, we see this stuff every day. And instead of just ignoring it, laughing it off, or, you know, judging the people who shared it without actually reading the article, we need to talk to them or talk to people around us and say, I saw this online and I'm pretty sure that's not right. We are all educated under very good school systems for the most part that teach us how to know when sources are incredible. Know how to look when it was published. Who sponsors that website? We need to be responsible for looking at articles, actually reading them, seeing in the fine print who funds the data, and speaking about it, not just judging people online. Okay, thank you, Megan. <laughs> finally, we'll have the other best door come up here. And Amanda, your question is gonna come from Gordon Moore. Hi Amanda. So I gave you some feedback at the end of round one. I said we're going to talk about that link between school systems being the problem and how we actually talk to people. And I thought about it a little bit more. And so I've developed a question that hopefully intersects the two areas for you. I'm curious. I'm big on talking to people in all different shapes and ways and sizes. And my question for you is ultimately, when you say that you want to talk to people and that we need to talk to one another about science, my question is, where should those conversations take place? What is, in your opinion, the best community, whether it be live or virtual, for scientific communication and the conversations surrounding the importance of scientific communication to take place? Okay, so I hesitate to say social media because there are tons of scientists who do post on social media, and I follow them, and the types of things they say is, Today I sequenced the genome of uh, Salamanders plethodontera and I went out and I collected the egg sacs and it's like, I honestly don't think anyone in this room is going to sit and listen to that and then understand why it's important for their tax dollars to go to it. So what I think the best thing is is for us to have mediators and what has somewhat been called pop star scientists. Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson among them. People who are incredibly advanced in science yet have this person ability to sit and talk to people, make science funny, make science interesting. Neil deGrasse Tyson has crowds 10 times larger than this come out to see him talk. And he's just an astrophysicist, but a funny one. So, yes, I think social media is important because the majority of the radicalized people you're going to meet is not necessarily a person, especially because it's hard to talk about those things out loud. So doing it online is important, but you have to remember that when there's that barrier, people have an easier time saying, no, you're just an educated elite who wants to make me feel stupid. So I think that in person is the best way, and ensuring that the tone stays at no one is stupid, because we're not born with critical pieces. Thank you. just an astrophysicist, but I don't know if that's uh, in the cards for me. So I want to thank again our contestants and our judges. That is the end of round two. So we still have $250 on the line in one round to go. Who will take home this power?
Okay, but beware. Round three might be the most challenging round of all the way we've seen this competition. So we have a question that will dis be displayed on the screen behind us for the contestants. They have never seen this question before. They will have 10 minutes to prepare and deliver a speech for our judges as part of our third round. Contestants, are you ready? Okay, here we go. It's a deep breath. Contestants, this is your final round of questions. <laughs> Teach for a moment, let's work through it together, let's break it down. Okay, okay. The first part is what we call a setup. We have seen a wealth of misinformation about science and health research appear online and spread rapidly through social media. That said, online social networks have also provided the public with new ways to engage in science and learn about the world around them. Looking to the future of science communication. Do you see social networks as a positive or negative influence on public understanding of science and health information? Why? Regardless of your view, what other venues should science communicators consider to deliver important information to the public? How can new approaches help to reverse trends of misinformation and sensationalism regarding scientific topics? How can communicators reach the anti-science demographic we often rely on? So now the contestants have their question. They will be escorted to a quiet room where they will have 10 minutes to prepare to deliver the speech? I see the bad moon rising.
such a positive or negative influence on public understanding of science and health information. Why? Regardless of, you, of your view, what other venues should science communicators consider to deliver important information to the public? How can new approaches help to reverse trends of misinformation and sensationalism regarding scientific topics? How can communicators reach the anti-science demographic we often find online? Remember, they have just five minutes to actually answer the question, which is about as long as it took Christine to read the question. So, let's see how this goes. Let's bring up our first contestant, Jennifer Magnoli.
Good. All right. Thanks, guys. So, thank you.
So I like the fact that your delivery style is very much based in conversation. We talk about extemporaneous delivery. We talk about it being conversational. One thing I would just caution you a little bit is sometimes there could be too much engagement. Some of the engagement is good. We get to raise the hands. We get to show. But this is your moment, right? So we want to hear your opinions and your thoughts. So I think rhetorical questions that are challenging and promote critical thinking were good. When you got to that place and you got us to challenge our thinking, that was the moment that I really appreciated and enjoyed the most. So thank you. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Megan. Let's have a conversation about these vaccines causing autism. 
being nice. Remember that's a human being, not just a vessel for fake news. If we can just change the world by having those three people more common in it, then the spread of information is going to decrease. And I don't think we have to worry. Thank you. Job. I think that the way that that speech was organized made it really easy to follow, which is so important. But you weren't focused on the way it was. You didn't come across as, as though you were focused on the way it was organized. It was very conversational. It made me think, especially as a journalist, someone who watches the news and has the time. Uh, I think that was a great speech overall. Good job. Yeah, you started out with the, the kind of critical thinking piece, the sort of away from the question, and kind of the school piece, and how we're in that spot. And then I was waiting for like, how do you tie it back? And then you did, you came back into like, okay, so what do we do? And you had those three points. And I agree that it, it felt very natural. Um, definitely, even first putting it together, it was five minutes. Like you had it kind of compre comprehensively put together, um, but it felt like it flowed really nicely. Okay. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, so our fourth speaker in the final round will be Kathleen Moriarty. Before I get into it, can we just take a minute to look at these four amazing young women? Women in STEM, everyone. This is pretty great that we're all on.
Thank you, judges. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, and our final speaker, last but not least, is Marlies. You know, about 500 million tweets are put out a day. That's 6,000 tweets a second. How many of them do you think are cats? <laughs> media is an absolutely massive platform that we cannot ignore as scientists or as communicators. If we're going to reach our audience of both the general layman and science deniers and not betray the truth or make our scientific sensations over sensational, then we need to pay attention to the content and to our audience. We need to make our content compelling while still accurate and explanatory. And we need to pay attention to what our audience is looking for in our given particular pieces of content. I'm going to be using the word content a lot in my speech. <laughs> Social media is not something that's going to go away very easily. We've established that quite well. But if we can take advantage of it, then we can take advantage of the fact that we can get the facts out to everybody. First of all, we need to make our content compelling. Now, I know that the journalists in the room will appreciate this. But the fight for eyeballs, so to say as they used to call it in the world of print industry, is not over and it's age old. Consider what you look at when you open up your Twitter feed or when you open up your Facebook feed every morning. What catches your eye the most? Is it a text-heavy post? Or is it an interesting graphic? Is it a video that's well put together and well edited that has captions so you can read it in class? And that generally will make your day more interesting. Now, I noticed the gentleman in the back reading the newspaper uh, during one of the speeches going on. I'm glad that you like the Daily Campus, but you kind of wonder, what do we put in there to make it? <laughs> but it makes you wonder, what can you put in that will make your content more compelling? We need to be able to condense down our scientific headlines, and we need to be able to condense down our research so that we can give it to people in a nutshell. Something that will make them smile, something that will make them laugh, and something that can make them more well informed. At the same time, however, we must not betray the essence of the science behind it. I've read so many scientific articles in newspapers and on online news platforms that will have some sort of sensational headline about how we're curing HIV or cancer, but they won't really give much of a compelling explanation behind it. They won't go into the research that's been done. They won't go into the immunology. They won't go into the reasoning behind it. It leaves me, as somebody with a science background, frustrated. And it more or less overts and coverts the original intent and the original research behind the article. So when we put this content forward and we make it compelling, we don't need to just say, look, this frog can turn its stomach inside out. And yes, there are frogs that do that. We need to say this frog can turn its stomach inside out because of a special set of muscles in its esophagus, and it does it so that it can get rid of the poisonous insects that it may ingest. And finally, we need to consider our audience when we are pushing forward these little packages, these little factoids, and these stories on social media. And I'm talking about not just our layman audience, not just people who are boredly scrolling around on Twitter. I'm talking about the people who are anti-vaxxers and the people who are climate change deniers and flat earthers. Because they have a motivation for believing what they believe. Anti-vaxxers, a lot of the time, are single or stay-at-home mothers that want the best for their children. They're not anti-vax because they think it's a fun thing to do on a Saturday night. They're anti- <laughs> They are anti- <laughs> They are anti-vax because they think that putting vaccines in their kids is actually harmful to them. If we reach out to them over social media and we alleviate those fears, if we say you're not hurting your children by doing this, or this is a way that you can help your child, if you give them this specific type of vitamin, or if you make sure that they're eating healthy and getting these types of vitamins, and here's why, then that will assuage their fears. Using social media actually is quite a lot like being a journalist in that you need to constantly evaluate your audience and you need to constantly evaluate the truth and the substance behind your story and make sure that you're not betraying the context. And of course that you're trying to get the attention of people so that they look at it. Social media is a massive 
Free Speech Forum. The original founder behind the Free Speech Forum doctrine and that we should have unmitigated and unrestrained free speech said that in a free speech, uh, excuse me, in a free speech forum that the truth will out when set against lies. This may not seem like the case in the, or in the age of fake news. However, if we pay attention to what we do, then we can give the truth a fighting chance. Thank you. perspective, you are spot on, because we're constantly being pushed to use social media. Um, on Saturday nights, we have a great newscast on at 10 and 11 o'clock, you're welcome to watch that. Um, <laughs> Fox is guilty. Um, just because that's so interesting, and the fact that you have such a limited time to put that together, and get so many laughs, and be yourself, I think that you just being genuine, really, really came on and made it interesting, so it's a great job to Just real quickly, I want to commend you. You're funny, and to be funny, you have to take chances. You took a number of chances tonight, and not all of them landed, but you kept going back for the morning. I thought that was fantastic, so well done. All right, great. Thank you, Molly. Jennifer Van Gogh. 